The year was 1997. Girl power was taking the world by storm, a young Stefan Milo was dominating the Worcester tennis scene, and almost as importantly, geneticists were making a scientific breakthrough. For the first time, we had recovered ancient DNA from a fragment of a Neanderthal, a humerus belonging to Neanderthal 1, the first ever Neanderthal found way back in 1856. It's hard to overestimate the importance of that moment. For the first time ever, we had genetic material from an extinct branch of humanity, another ancient hominin other than ourselves. It would be the first of many genetic studies into this mysterious group. And we would go on to discover that they weren't extinct as such, that a part of their DNA lives within us now, that our ancestors had children with them way back in prehistory. It truly was the start of a new chapter in the study of human evolution, a huge moment. But many of these studies on ancient Neanderthal DNA have a fundamental problem. So there had been, I think, 18 Neanderthal genome sequenced to various de degree of completeness um, sequenced over the past 10 years, but they've always been separated in space and in time. So it's been from all over Europe and, and from Siberia, but like thousands of years apart. So we never had an idea of what a Neanderthal community looked like. Uh, so that's sort of why we wanted to to see if we can find multiple Neanderthals from the same place. That's Laurie Skov, a geneticist at Berkeley down in California. As he said, all of the Neanderthals evolved in these ancient DNA studies are typically separated by a huge amount of space and a huge amount of time, thousands of years. That is until the Ritz and a team of researchers published this paper right here. Genetic insights into the social organization of Neanderthals. This team were able to extract DNA from 13 Neanderthals, all from the same place, all from basically the same time. I think it's the largest study of ancient Neanderthal DNA using ancient Neanderthal remains, and certainly our best shot at using genetics to understand a real Neanderthal community, real Neanderthal families. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. It's absolutely incredible because you're probably an archaeology nerd like me or you're high at 4 a.m. and somehow stumbled on this video. Either way, let's dig into it. Just super quickly have to thank the sponsor of today's video, HelloFresh, America's best bestest meal kit delivery service. Now, as you all know, food is any nutritious substance that you eat, drink, or absorb in order to maintain life and growth. And here's four reasons why you should consider HelloFresh letting you maintain life and growth. First, it's convenient. You're busy, I'm busy, my wife's busy, somehow my kids are busy. HelloFresh is gonna drop off a meal kit at your door every week. Uh, so that's just one thing less to worry about. You don't have to worry about what's for dinner tonight. They've got it covered. Number two, they're super easy to make. Uh, I'm gonna be honest, it's hard to tidy your kitchen well enough to look tidy for an ad read. So I cooked mine outside in my garden on a single gas stove. And it was, couldn't have been easier. You got step-by-step -step instructions, you got a nice picture to show you how it should look at the end. It's easy, it's very easy. Expectation. Reality. Not bad, not bad. Three, variety. Every week there are 40 chef-crafted recipes to choose from. There's always something to eat. There's really something for everyone. Four, it's affordable. Way cheaper than getting a takeaway all the time. That's ridiculous and terrible for you. HelloFresh is a much better option than that. And it's even cheaper because you can go to hellofresh.com and use 50 Stefan Milo for 50% off plus free shipping. Uh, it's really gonna help you maintain life and growth, <laughs> as food does, in a convenient, affordable, tasty way. All right, back to the video, back to the video. All right, first, let me pull up Google Earth here, and we can see where these bones came from. Southern Siberia has been a fantastic source for Neanderthal remains. It's certainly a region that they called home for thousands and thousands of years. All of the samples used in this study are from Chagiskaya and Okladnikov caves, right where Russia meets Kazakhstan and Mongolia. All these Neanderthals were from just two caves. Chagiskaya and Okladnikov are also very close to Denisova cave, which 
will definitely come up later in this video for sure. Something really interesting is going on in how these three caves and three populations interact with each other. This is a list of all the different Neanderthals that we sampled, that we tried to get DNA out of. Oh, wow, that's a lot. Yeah, and then you can also, we also tried a lot of Oklatnikov individuals, but the DNA preservation there was really bad. We, we did 10 Oklatnikovs and 17 uh, Czechist guys. There was only a few of the Czechist guys where we didn't have genetic data. And a lot of the Oklatnikovs where we didn't have <laughs> genetic data. So we tried 27, but wow. there are more. In, in Czechist guy caves, I think there's 80 or something. I had no idea there were that many Neanderthals from that cave. That, that cave is crazy. I think there's like hundreds of thousands of bones and tool pieces. So you can actually see all the samples here in this figure. Well, I mean, they are really uh, close in proximity and all seem to roughly come from like one sedimentary layer. Yeah, exactly. Wow. And, and it's only the gray part. This is the cave seen from above. Yeah. It's only the gray part that's been excavated. So it's like a third of the cave that has been excavated yet, yielding 80 Neanderthals. So you know that, that there's a possibility that there will be even more Neanderthals found in this cave. And the excavations are still going on. Before I spoke to Loritz, I honestly had no idea that archaeologists had recovered so many Neanderthals from this cave. I mean, just look at the IDs of some of these fossil remains. Chagaskaya 60, Chagaskaya 63. There's a lot of Neanderthals here. It really makes you wonder what happened in those caves. How did they accumulate so many remains? Was it perhaps a particularly good spot for Neanderthals? So they're just living there for a long time and these bones are just naturally accumulating generation after generation. Was there some sort of disaster that trapped them all in there? Were they deliberately depositing the dead? Maybe even brought in by predators? The mind boggles. The mind uh, boggles. There's a lot of Neanderthals in those two caves. I really wanted to ask Loritz, from a genetics point of view, what's the advantage of having so many samples? The more people you have, the more you can talk about recent time of the ancestors of those people. So for instance, yeah, if I have your genome or my genome, it's the same information I get like 200,000 years ago, more or less. Yeah. So it doesn't add so much, but where it really adds is the, is the is resolution close to where these individuals lived, which is just what we want to get at with the, studying a Neanderthal community. We want to know how were they related. We don't want to know what the average Neanderthal population size was 100 years before the lift or something like that. I'm sure this is a, a simplification, but basically studying one person's or one Neanderthal's genome can give you a good overview of their evolution, but it can't give you a lot of detail about the community that they lived in. Who were they related to? How did this community interact with other communities? Stuff like that. But with this increased sample size, we can start to ask those kind of questions. Okay, so we have the ability when we have all these uh, genomes to discuss relationships between Neanderthals. So what what is the relationship between the Neanderthals in Chagaskaya Cave? Are they from a big community? Are they closely related? How, how do all these Neanderthals fit together? Yeah, that's a, I'm glad you asked. So, so what we can say about this community is that it's small and has been small for quite a while. So it's something like 10 to 20 individuals or something like that. And, it, and it's been like this for a couple of generations. This result that this Neanderthal community was quite small and had been that way for several generations really adds to a growing body of evidence, particularly genetic evidence, that suggests that Neanderthals' communities were pretty small, pretty spread out, pretty inbred, at least compared to anatomically modern humans. This result has really interesting implications when we think about why the Neanderthals aren't around anymore, and why do modern people, like me and you, have such a small percentage of Neanderthal DNA? There are so many possible reasons for their demise. Natural disasters, competition with Homo sapiens, assimilation into homo sapiens maybe <laughs> we absorb them into their community into our communities and just chipped away at their population whatever the cause of their ultimate demise if their populations were very small very spread out perhaps very inbred yeah they might have been very vulnerable very susceptible to change 
Interesting to think about, interesting to think about. Still, just because this population was small doesn't mean it was totally cut off. What's so great about this study is that we can see into Neanderthal families, see into Neanderthal communities. So in terms of relationships, we have some of them who are related to each other, but also some who are not related to anyone else. So you can see that some of them are related and we found the first ever father-daughter, Neanderthal father-daughter pair, which is like these two individuals here. And then we find two individuals that are second degree related and some that share heteroplasmy. It's called so they share like part of their maternally inherited DNA, meaning that their, their mothers were closely related. So D, E and C all share mothers that were closely related. Yeah. Or yeah. like something like they could have shared a grandmother or something like that. Oh, so really closely related then. They're yeah. cousins basically, probably. Yeah, it's, it's actually hard because, so this, the father here, uh, check this guy number, uh, number D, looks to be very similar to E and we we're actually not sure if it's the same individual or if they are first degree related. And, and the reason we can't tell it's because Chikiska is a tooth that has been eaten by a hyena. So it's heavily contaminated with hyena DNA. So it looks like, you know, a bit Neanderthal, a bit, a bit human contamination and a bit of hyena contamination as well. <laughs> Do you ever hear something that just makes your brain pause for a second? D could be E, but it's hard to tell for sure because E was eaten by a hyena. I mean, I, mean, I feel bad for the guy. I, for, <laughs> I feel bad for the guy. But that is a fun sentence to say. That is a really fun sentence to say. <laughs> How can people not love learning about prehistory when you get to say sentences like that? I, it's so hard when you just say something like that. My mind just starts wondering. <laughs> wondering. Yeah, like, 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 is this, is that how they died? Were they all eaten by hyenas or, you know? Oh, that's why I'm wondering why, you know, it's so, why so many Neanderthals in that cave? Uh, exactly. And I, I don't know. A and L have a second degree relationship. There's quite a lot of things that could be, but it's something like uncle, niece, aunt, nephew, something like that. Close relatives still. And just to, to, to give you an idea of like how much is happening, like there's been a new method after we published this paper that can sort of, that is a bit better at estimating relationships, can do it more accurately. And that method, it finds all these relationships but also suggests that H and L might be sort of closely related, as mm -hmm. in third degree related. I just love being able to look at this super simple Neanderthal family tree. It's so humanizing to see like a Neanderthal father and daughter. As a, as a dad to a daughter myself, I love it. I love it. It's so humanizing. It really brings the past to life. It's cool. It's super cool. I mean, I, I suppose, in a way, if they're from a very small community and it's been that way for several generations, then that's, that's what we would expect. Maybe the outliers are the B and I and F and G and J and K. Like, why aren't these people more closely related? Yeah, exactly. Like, when, yeah, exactly. Like, if you ever have a small community, then you will just be the second or third cousin of someone. Maybe the outliers are this B and I and F, G, J and K. Who are these people? Why aren't they more closely related to the others? Where did they come from? To understand how genetics can help us tease apart community relations, we need a tiny bit of context, teeny tiny bit of context. You inherit your genome equally from your parents, half from your mum, half from your dad. But there are some parts of your genome, of your DNA, that come exclusively from one parent. Men inherit their Y chromosomes from their father. So that provides an exclusive genetic record of the males in your family tree. Your mitochondrial DNA is passed down by a mother to her children and will only be passed down by her daughters except for maybe in, a, in extremely rare circumstances that we're not quite sure, like a fraction of a percentage chance it might be passed down by fathers in some extremely rare scenarios that maybe exist, maybe don't, but, but seemingly 99.99999% of the time, your mitochondrial DNA is passed down by a mother and her daughters. So this provides an exclusive record of women in your family history. This allows us to compare the Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA 
within these Neanderthals and get a sense of how evolution and society is affecting men and women differently. When they made this comparison, Loritz and this team made a really interesting discovery. An important factor here is that it's not an isolated population. It's not an isolated community. It is a very small community that is exchanging individuals with other communities. Because if you just have one community of, of, of 10 to 20 individuals and that never exchanges with other communities, it goes extinct. That's sort of the starting point. But then when we looked at the data, it turns out that the mitochondria diversity is 10 times higher than the white chromosome. So a factor of 10, so like a, a clearly significant difference. Yeah. And, and so the, the question is, how can that be? One way you can think about it is that if you have all these different communities and women are moving between these communities and they are the one passing down the mitochondria, then you could get a mitochondria that's in a community that looks very different from the other ones because it came from somewhere else. So that will give you a lot of mitochondrial diversity, but the Y chromosome diversity will still be low. According to the results from Chagaskaya Cave then, there is some mechanism by which Neanderthal women are moving around this society, moving around different groups. So much so that their mitochondrial DNA is 10 times more diverse than the Y chromosomes. Men are seemingly staying put, women are seemingly moving. This is actually, this pattern of female movement is actually quite common, both yeah. in, in modern humans, in, in a lot of human societies. Of course, some societies do other things, but and you also see similar, pattern, similar patterns in chimpanzee, for instance. Mm. And you see similar patterns in gorillas, mm. uh, but not in orangutans. So, oh, really? Yeah. So whatever these lands are doing is actually not so different from, from humans. So far, we've only discussed the Neanderthals from Chagaskaya Cave. But when we look at the two Neanderthals that DNA was extracted from at Okladnikov Cave, again, we see this pattern of female movement. So there are two individuals there that carry the same mitochondria. So again, shared mother. If they don't share heteroplasmy, so we can't say it's that close to each other, but they do have an identical copy of mitochondria. Chagaskaya B shares the exact same mitochondrial DNA as Okladnikov A. We can't really look into much detail and say how closely they were related to each other, but they were so closely related on their female line that their mitochondrial DNA did not have a single mutation between them. They had exactly the same mitochondrial DNA. So all we can say is that they lived within a couple of thousand years of each other. It was recent enough that there was not a single mutation yet in the mitochondrial DNA. Exactly. Interesting, interesting. It's really fascinating to see this pattern of female movement in this community and imagine, speculate, how we got our Neanderthal DNA. Like, is your 2% Neanderthal DNA from your great, 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 <laughs> however many times, uh, Neanderthal grandma? It's certainly possible. No modern human has the mitochondrial DNA of a Neanderthal, but that doesn't mean we're not related to them on our female side, on our the female side of our family history. Let me draw a hypothetical scenario quickly, because this is kind of fun to illustrate. Let me get a paper or something. Excuse me, chaps. Let's say, hypothetically, you have a Neanderthal woman who joins a community with homo sapiens, sexy homo sapiens. And let's say, hypothetically, they only have sons, or maybe only sons survive into adulthood, something like that. If these sons continue to have children with that community, with homo sapiens women in that community. The grandchildren of this Neanderthal woman, Neanderthal man, would not have this mitochondrial connection to this Neanderthal woman anymore because they only had sons. That mitochondrial connection is broken. But that wouldn't mean that the children of these boys didn't have a Neanderthal grandma. Beautiful family tree here. Now, obviously, our interbreeding with Neanderthals was way more complex than that. It didn't just happen one time with one family. But you can see here how mitochondrial DNA or Y chromosomes are really susceptible to replacement because they're just passed down on one side of the family and you could happen to have children that's the other side. I really had to clear that up because in an old video of mine, a now deleted video, I 
said that because no one had Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA, it means that we're related to Neanderthals on our male side, that we had a Neanderthal granddad. That is something that's often said online, but it's, it's wrong. It's an oversimplification. We could have Neanderthals on our male or female line. We don't have Neanderthal Y chromosomes either. However, Neanderthals and Homo sapiens interacted with each other. They weren't alone in the vast expanses of Asia. There were also the Denisovans. And again, this study has some really interesting things to say about how these groups interacted. Chagiskaya and Okladnikov cave are very close to Denisova cave. In fact, Okladnikov actually sits on the same river as Denisova. It's in the same valley along the river Anui, I think it's pronounced. Even Chagiskaya is just about 100 kilometers away over a mountain valley, over on the other side of a valley, but still just 100 kilometers away. These caves are just like three days walk from each other maybe, not far, not far at all. For those that don't know, Denisova Cave was made famous in 2010 when geneticists tested what they thought was a Neanderthal finger bone, pinky bone, uh, but it turned out that it belonged to a group that was closely related to Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, but also quite genetically distinct. And we now call this group Denisovans after Denisova Cave. It really was a surprising result, totally changed our view of human evolution. All these three groups are all mixing with each other, having families like this. It's really interesting, it's really cool. We know that Denisovans and Neanderthals in this region of Southern Siberia are interacting with each other because in Denisova cave, we found the remains of a child that had a Denisovan father and a Neanderthal mother. The mom's Neanderthal, the mom's Neanderthal, and so she passes on the mitochondria mm -hmm. because of the female. And that mitochondria is very similar to the Czechis, to, to the Czechiskaya uh, mitochondria. Oh, really? So the mother of that Neanderthal Denisovan hybrid was relatively closely related to these individuals that, that Exactly, yeah. Um, and relatively is the key. Uh... So again, we see this pattern of female movement. Three caves connected to each other again on their female line. You would think that the Neanderthals at Chagaskaya and Okladnikov also had a fair amount of Denisovan admixture then, as they're living in the same region. Yeah. Did, did this group have much Denisovan admixture? In no, so that's, even, that's even what's even more interesting. If you if we take the the video carbon dating and the the dating of 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 sediments in Chagiska Cave, we think it's been occupied between fifty and sixty thousand years ago. And if we look at sediment DNA from the Nisova Cave, there are also the Nisovans present around this time, fifty to sixty thousand years ago. Mm. So they're supposed to be both around and 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 close to each other, but we don't find evidence a lot of the Nisova ancestry in our Neanderthals. There's not a lot of evidence of, of recent mixing of these two populations. It's a bit of a puzzler. It's a bit of a, a, bit of a head scratcher, isn't it? We know that Neanderthals and Denisovans are in the region at the same time because we've got that first generation hybrid who had a Neanderthal mother, relatively closely related to these other groups. And yet the other Neanderthals at this cave seemingly don't have any Denisovan ancestry or no recent Denisovan ancestry. Why is that? So yes, that is very interesting because why not? I, I mean, the boring explanation is that because of these uncertainties, like they're, they're between 50 and 60,000 years ago, they some of the, they could have been separated by thousands of years, you know, and just yeah. never met each other. That is also a possibility. <sighs> it's a shame, isn't it? It's just so hard to say. Our dating methods are just not accurate enough. But it's also interesting to think about if there are some reason these two populations don't meet with each other. But we shouldn't exclude the possibility that maybe there was some other sort of barrier separating them. Whether it's, I don't know, just plain old geography, or Neanderthals and Denisovans are exploiting different resources, and so they're in the region at different seasons, at different times. Or maybe there's just some cultural barrier, linguistic barrier separating them. They don't like the look of each other so much. Head scratcher, this huge sample of Neanderthals from the region right next door to where we found Denisovans, where we know Denisovans are interacting with Neanderthals. And yet from this huge sample, these Neanderthals are not closely related to Denisovans. Puzzler, puzzler. What I really love about this study 
is that I think it's a glimpse into the future. When we start to get more and more Neanderthal remains, more and more ancient human remains from whether they're Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, Denisovans, whoever. And our methods of extracting DNA and studying DNA improve. We can start to ask really interesting questions about who are these people related to? How do they move across the landscape? And yeah, who's their dad? <laughs> who's their daddy? All right, you can all go to bed now. The, the stoners at 4 a.m., you can go to bed now. That's all I've got to say. Boop.